<laughs> Good evening, and welcome to Talk It Over. We have a very special edition tonight because my guest is Michael Landon. I don't know how to describe him. We could start with Little Joe on Bonanza, then we could move on to the creator, the director, the writer, and the star, Little House on the Prairie. We could talk about his movies. We can talk about his family. But we've also invited some kids, the people that he seems to know how to write and produce for the best, to come be with us on the show. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. The reason we invited the kids to come be on this show and participate is because when you have the responsibility of programming for a TV station, it's a huge responsibility for children to try and provide something that is wholesome, that is good, that is entertaining. They have to watch it. And you seem to, to be the man that, that has the pulse on the kids that, can, that is doing this currently. There aren't very many. The Little House on the Prairie, Father Murphy. Why do you have that special knack to do children's television? I, I'm not so sure if it's, uh, it's a matter of having uh, a special knack. As much as it is, uh, there just isn't very much children's programming. Uh, there are shows that they, you know, say are for children, but I don't think you have to, to do something totally goofy in order for, uh, for a child to enjoy it. I think kids are a lot brighter than, uh, uh, than most people give them credit for. And they can look at a good, solid family show, and uh, they want to get emotional, and they want to cry, and they want to laugh the same way we do. Uh, we can probably learn more from our kids than, uh, than our kids are going to learn from us. I think if we uh, remember that, we may do a little better programming for them. On Little House, you had a set of children, and as those children grew up, then they started a family, and now you've got more children. You always show and have children in your writing and in your producing. Well, I do the same thing in my, uh, in my married life. <laughs> <laughs> so I just continue to have children. Uh, I love kids. I, I would have liked to have stayed, uh, stayed on Little House, really, ex as an actor, uh, except that... Uh, it just got too hard for me. Uh, but once you kids grow up and uh, you get married, uh, I just don't think it's a good idea to, to show you uh, coming over to dad's place all the time to ask for advice. It's time for you to take care of your own lives. Uh, more than likely when you get older, your folks are going to ask you for advice anyway. Uh, that's why I left the show, because my girls had grown up and it was their turn and hopefully the show will continue to do well as it is. We were chatting beforehand, and I asked you about your religious background, and you told me how you're raising all of your children and what religions they are. Well, but yeah, I've got a, a combination. Uh, I was raised Jewish. I'm Jewish, and I have uh, uh, I have a couple of Catholic children, and I have a few Presbyterian children, and I have uh, a little combination. Uh, I've got some Jewish children. Everybody gets to, to really pick and, and make a decision. And I think that's healthy, good for kids. You must have done a lot of carpooling. Uh, yeah, it, but, but it's very unlikely that you'll have prejudice, at least religious prejudice, within a family like that. I, I think that helps. When we were chatting, I said to you, um, most people think of you as the star and, and the writer and the producer and so on. But if they thought of you for nothing else, it would be the man who brought the problem of bedwetting to the attention of the public, took it out of the closet, and, and made all of the people who were bedwetters and all the children who are bedwetters feel like human beings? Well, when I was a kid, uh, I thought I was the only person in the world that wet the bed. I mean, I had no notion that anybody else ever wet the bed because nobody ever talked about it. I mean, guys don't want to talk to you and say, hey, I wet the bed. <laughs> I make my pants turn yellow. <laughs> Uh, so you just don't know. Everybody keeps it a big secret. And a lot of times uh, parents think you're doing it uh, to spite them. Uh, they think you're lazy. You just don't want to get out of bed. Well, there's a lot of reasons for kids uh, wetting the bed. Some are physical, some are sleep patterns, most of the time sleep patterns. But I can guarantee you as a former bedwetter parents out there that, uh, that nobody wants to lie in a pool of urine at night and, <laughs> and have it burn your skin. I mean, it isn't fun and it isn't for spite. Uh, it's just something that happens and we're all going to grow out of it. The most important thing is to know that there, there are 25 million of us. So, uh, I mean, if there was a war on, 
all us bedwetters could get together and we have a big army, I'll tell you. Your own army. That's right. Why is it you think that some children wet the bed at home, but when they spend the night at a friend's, they don't wet the bed? Well, most of the time I think it, it's a uh, sleep pattern. You, uh, at a young age, you sleep very, very, very deep, and you just don't have the physical control at that point. When you go over to a friend's house, you don't hear the same sounds. You hear other people breathing, other people, if you're having a pajama party, other people giggling, uh, people making noise, messing around, punching, arguing, all the wonderful things you do when you sleep over at a friend's house. When you sleep in your own house, it's the same noise you hear every night. So you're very used to it. You go into a deep sleep and you don't wake up until you're lying in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment and we'll turn the questioning over to the real pros, the kids. <laughs> we can have trouble getting through the show without giggling. Michael Landon has got, got us all laughing here. He's got the giggles, too. <laughs> I'm going to turn the questioning over to the expert. These are the third grade students from Mrs. Zuniga's class at Sam U's school. And we're going to let them ask Michael Landon some questions. Take it away. How did you get interested in acting? The, the first time I acted was in a, uh, my sister wanted to be an actor. And I went to a town called Haddonfield. It was near the little town that I lived in because she wanted to try out for a play. And they didn't have anybody there to play a Japanese houseboy. So just for the heck of it, I read for the part. And I got the part as the, as the Japanese houseboy in a play called The Bat. And it was the first time that I'd ever done anything on stage. And I found out that when I was playing somebody else, I wasn't so shy. Uh, and I like the feeling of being somebody else and being in front of people. That's how I started. I think you just took somebody's question. Did I? Yeah. Who was going to ask that question here? Was that your question? Hmm. What's your question? Um, well, when you started acting on Little House on the Prairie, did it affect you and your family in any way? Uh, in terms of my relationship with my children or something? No, not really. The, uh, it was the opposite of that. I actually did Little House on the Prairie uh, because of uh, one of my daughters who read the books and enjoyed them. And I thought, geez, if I'm going to do another television series, I'd like to do one that's going to be on early so that my children can find out what I do for a living and that, uh, that we could watch together as a family. And that's why I did it. Yes, sir. Um, are you trying to teach your daughter how to act like you are? Oh, no. And uh, my daughter, who's an actress? No. No, everybody has to be who they are. You, you can't uh, be somebody else. You're much better to get comfortable and, uh, and feel right about you. Because it's different for everybody. Everybody has a different method of performing. Some people need a lot of time and quiet. Uh, I'm the kind of guy, I'd, before the most emotional scene in the world, I just laugh and uh, have fun with my crew, and then I'm ready. Makes no well, difference. Um, if they wanted to, would you teach them? Oh, sure. I help them. I mean, I'll, if they ask me for suggestions, but you can't run anybody else's life. Yes, sir? Can shy people act? Oh, uh, I probably was the shyest person I knew. Uh, when I went to the University of Southern California, I managed to, in the less than a year that I went there, I managed not to meet anyone because I was so shy. I was too afraid to go up and ask a girl for a date. I never had a date in that school. I had to quit school to get a date. That was a big <laughs> trouble. Uh, if you're very, very shy, I think you'll find most actors are very, very shy and introverted. And that's why when they get to play somebody else, they can be that other person, not be so shy. What was your most favorite movie that you made? Most favorite movie that I made? In terms of uh, male response, I would have to say The Loneliest Runner, the movie that I made about bedwetting, because the male response touched me. It was important to me, because I got letters from fathers who said, uh, gee, I feel bad about what I've done with my, my kids in terms of bedwetting, and now I understand. And fathers and, uh, and daughters and fathers and sons who sat in the living room and looked at each other and cried because they, they both understood for the first time. It's amazing, after all the years and all the knowledge that's there, that people just didn't go out and find it. Uh, that was my favorite. Yes, dear. When you became an actor, did it affect or change your life in any way? Yes, I was able to pay my rent 
<laughs> and they stopped repossessing my cars. <laughs> yeah, it changed my life. You, you give up a certain amount of things in terms of privacy. Uh, I really can't have fun at Disneyland with my kids. Uh, I can have fun at Magic Mountain because I go at night and I wear a funny mask. <laughs> and we run on all the rides and we go crazy. But if it's a place where there are a lot of tourists, you give up that. But on the other hand, uh, there are so many pluses, so many bonuses. I mean, it's a, it's a good way to make, it make a living. It's good. Yes, love? Um, what, how do you get the ideas for Little House on the Prairie? The ideas for the scripts? Sometimes it'll be uh, an article in a newspaper. Sometimes it'll be a conversation I have with... Uh, with one of my daughter's friends or with one of my own children, you know. A child, I say, I just heard you got new eyeglasses. Where are they? I want to see how they look on you. They don't have them on. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot of girls in your school. You, you get your eyeglasses and you just don't put your eyeglasses on. Well, there's nothing wrong with wearing eyeglasses. So you do a show about that. It's more important that people see and not be concerned that uh, uh, they don't look like some kind of a commercial ad for perfection. Uh, it's not good for everybody in the world to look the same. Yes, love. Where were you born? I was born in Forest Hills, Long Island, in uh, the state of New York, on a tennis court. <laughs> Fortunately, my mother had lost the match. <laughs> yes. When you were little, did, were you in a lot of plays? And no, not many. See, when I was a uh, when I was a young lad. <laughs> Uh, you weren't supposed to be on the stage and do plays because all the rest of the guys that you went to school with would call you funny names. <laughs> uh, so the only plays I ever did were outside of town. I never was in a, in a school play. Nowadays, it's okay. I mean, being an actor and being in school plays is not considered as, uh, as oddball as it was years ago. Can you hold on to your questions? And we'll be right back with Michael Landon. Definitely the one I'm going to get. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> Mark Landon is our guest, and so is the class from Mrs. Zuniga's third grade progressive class at Sam U School. Okay, where do we leave off? Uh, I don't know. Have you asked? No, right there. When did you get started? Robin Williams. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go ahead. When did you get started in Little House on the Prairie? Uh, let's see, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, a gentleman came to me with, uh, who had uh, purchased the rights to the books and said, would you like to make a series out of it? And I got together with several other people and we went ahead with it and we've been very successful, very lucky with it. Yes, sir. When you were little, did you want to be anything else besides I wanted to be a doctor, mm -hmm. more than anything. Um, my family didn't have enough money. I couldn't go to, to, to school then. That's kind of a cop-out, probably, because uh, I also did very badly in school, uh, and that was my own fault. I never felt that I would be able to go anywhere with my life until, believe it or not, until I started uh, into sports and through the javelin, and I was an all-American javelin thrower, and that's how I got to a university. But if, if I could be anything else in the world than a filmmaker, I would be, uh, I would be a doctor. Yes, dear. Well, when you were acting, before you acted, do you, you, did you get butterflies a lot? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. You mean before you go out on stage? Yeah. Oh, yes, very much so. And probably even more butterflies when you would have to go in and read for a part with, against other actors, because you all sit in an office and you're all lined up and everybody wants the same part and everybody's starving. I mean, you all want that job so bad. And some people would walk in and uh, they kind of act like they really knew everybody and it would make you think, oh, geez, I'm not going to get the job. He's already a friend. And so you do the best you can. The way I used to do it when I would go into a casting director, if there was any chance at all to get angry in the scene, I would try to, to grab a hold of him and pull him out of his chair and, uh, and go bananas. Because then people would think, oh, he's so emotional. Uh, it's a con job. I mean, you just you do anything you can to try to get a job. Yes, my dear. How old were you when you were in your first play? When I was in my, oh, when my first play, that was kindergarten. I was five. <laughs> and that was the, again, I, as I recall, I'm glad you brought that up, because I only had two lines in that play, and I talked for about 15 minutes until they dragged me off. So <laughs> there must have been something within my system that made me want to be a performer. <laughs> yes, dear. 
You have one? How long have you been in show business? I've been in show business. Uh, I did my first professional job in 19... 30 years, 1953, the first time. And it made me feel so old when I said that. <laughs> yeah. Do you make a lot of friends being an actor? Uh, I don't think that really has much to do with how many real friends you make. Uh, a lot of people want to be your friend. But uh, going through life, boy, if you can get, you know, half a dozen really terrific friends. Good friends are people you can call when you have good news. There's a lot of people you can call when something horrible has happened to you, because most people love to hear that. But it's very tough to be able to find someone you can call up and say, hey, something terrific happened for me, and they want to share it and enjoy the fact that, sh that you've gotten some success and happiness. I think there's one back there. Yeah. Yes, love? How old were you when you were first on TV? When I was first on TV, I played the, uh, the part of a character from history named Casper Hauser, and I was uh, 18 years old. Yes, love. Well, after you were in that Japan, when you were a Japanese boy in that play, did you start taking a lot of drama courses? No, because they didn't have any. And I didn't, uh, I f the first time I ever took any acting lessons at all uh, was at Warner Brothers Studios. I went there and read for uh, the, the, the instructor there. And when I found there was no money involved, when I found out I could go to school there, I opened up a car wash across the street at a gas station. And I'd wash the executives' cars, and that enabled me to make a living and still go to their school. It was, it was very good for me. Yes, sir? Did you ever do voices for cartoons? For cartoons? No. Mm -hmm. For real. My voice just sounds like I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I never did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, when, you go, <laughs> <laughs> when you go around, are you recog recognized a lot? I mean... Do people ask you for autographs and stuff? Yes, and I always charge a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they recognize you. Television, you, you probably recognize people from television far more than you do even from, uh, from motion picture theaters. Yes? Um, did you ever, when you were making any movies, did you ever feel like quitting? You're so cute. <laughs> Go ahead, what? Did, when you were making any movies, did you ever feel like quitting in the middle of the movie? Oh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last movie I made, I felt like quitting in the middle of it. Yeah, it was terrible. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. Uh, but it's like any other job. I mean, some of the jobs that you, that you have are terrible. Uh, you may not get along with the boss, or the boss may be an idiot. Uh, but you've got to fight your way through it and, and do your best. But it's not all just fun. We'll be back in a moment with Michael Landon, and we'll talk a little bit about that last movie he made, and we'll talk about his celebrity tennis tournament. Michael Landon and third grade class from SAMU School are participating in our show this evening. Michael, you talked about the last movie and how you could have uh, lived without it, I think you phrased it. Uh, there was not a very nice article in TV Guide about oh, you yes. in that movie. Right. Written by a brilliant man named Bill Davidson, uh, who knows a tremendous amount about show business. Uh, the funny thing about TV Guide is they don't really need to be the National Enquirer. Uh, it just it surprises me, but it uh, it's happening almost throughout the media. There's a there's a whole great rush of attacking and, uh, and lying. And the TV Guide knows very well, and TV Guide is, uh, I'd be more than happy for TV Guide to, to uh, file a lawsuit against me. But I think TV Guide and Bill Davidson know that that entire article was a lie. <clears throat> but the fact is that it was a chance to, uh, to attack a celebrity uh, because their sales are down about 10%. They're now starting to get some competition from, uh, from another TV and cable uh, magazine from uh, from Time Inc and I just think TV Guide if you if you would like to improve your circulation you should do it by uh, having more interesting articles and things that are more intelligent than sitting down and uh, and being the National Enquirer otherwise you have to take the ads on TV where all the little heads bob across the screen and everybody says I want to know <laughs> it really hurts me because it's TV Guide and that's supposed to be the Bible of the industry 
and they're phonies. They're absolute phonies, and they know it. They could have interviewed that entire crew and found out what happened on that picture, but that would have ruined their story. Did they ask you? Hey, I don't, I'm not going to get into a, a shouting match with a man who's got psychological problems. I said, go call the crew. Interview the production manager. Interview the assistant directors. I mean, does this man really believe that an entire movie crew fits in my station wagon and I hijack a crew? And that I have an argument with a cinematographer and he vomits blood? I mean, it, it was something out of, uh, out of the National Enquirer. And from the National Enquirer, who cares? I mean, they're a bunch of idiots that, uh, that write that magazine. They're morons. And if you want to be a moron, spend your 40 cents and buy it or whatever it costs. Let's change the subject and talk about a happy event. It's going to take place tomorrow out at Randolph Park, and it's the Michael Landon Republic Airlines Double Tree Celebrity Tennis Classic. That's not the whole name, is it? I mean, that's, is it? that's the name, but your picture is up there. <laughs> yeah, and it's going to be fun. I, uh, we, we're really having a good time out there, and I hope uh, all you people out in, uh, in the Tucson area and surrounding come out and... Uh, and watch some celebrities and some terrific uh, businessmen and women in your community uh, make fools of themselves <laughs> uh, playing this tennis tournament. It's for 88 Crime and uh, uh, the Tucson Residence House and uh, two terrific charities that need you people out there in Tucson. Uh, there's nothing better for a community than, uh, than getting together and helping people that need your help. So please join us and, uh, and have some fun. What are the admission costs, do you know? Gee, I haven't the slightest idea, but... Uh, reasonable. They're very reasonable. Four dollars. You, you certainly are not going to pay a fortune to watch us play. <laughs> not uh, that good. There are some good tennis players, though. You'll see some good ones. Are There's, you a good uh, tennis player? No. Uh -uh. But nobody minds beating a star. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's Gee, right. I would have entered in that case. <laughs> the, the charity projects, did you get to select them? No. Uh, Anything I would do in, in a community, like I come over here to Tucson, because Tucson's done an awful lot for me. They, uh, without Tucson's medical facilities and uh, a doctor you have here in town named Rashid Khan, my, uh, my oldest daughter would, would not be alive now. You save my daughter's life. So whatever you need uh, in terms of, of help here, I'm more than happy to give. Great. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us. Michael Landon. Hi, I'm Michael Landon. I'm here in Tucson at KZAZ, Channel 11, to invite you to watch Little House on the Prairie. So join the Ingalls family, their friends, and their neighbors as they forge new frontiers on the prairie. Followed by... So I hope you'll join us here on Channel 11, KZAZ in Tucson. Thank you. Now, first thing. Okay. Now, can we do one with the kids? Yes. Okay. Those kids Get out of the camera. Is that you're on? Oh no, but don't. Oh, no. Are we doing the same uh, blurb again? Yeah. Oh, let me get you. Okay, Mike. Okay. You ready, kids? Okay, a little cheese, guys. Look happy. Don't look like I'm killing you, you know, like I'm some kind of molester. <laughs> okay, ready? All right. Hi, I'm Michael Landon here in Tucson at KZAZ Channel 11, inviting you to join the Boy Scouts of America. <laughs> <laughs> Still rolling? Oh, no, no. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Laddin here in Tucson at KZAZ Channel 11, inviting you to watch Little House on the Prairie. Join the Ingalls family, their friends, and their neighbors as they forge new beginnings. Now this time at the end I'm going to say, right guys, and you'll go, right. So please join me for Little House on the Prairie right here on KZAZ Channel 11. Right guys? Right! I never knew I had these many children. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.